One of the problems I'm not going to talk about, I don't know if anybody else is going to talk about this later, but is the problem of mixed estimators. And this is one of the uh, problems with Projector Monte Carlo. Suppose we want to calculate something besides the energy, uh, an operator A, particularly if A does not commute with Hamiltonian. Uh, then there are three different estimators that we can calculate. And phi is the exact wave function, and psi is the trial wave function. So the exact estimator is given by, we, we sandwich A in between two phi's, right? And we normalize it. The variational estimator is we sandwich A between two trial wave functions. The mixed estimator, we take a trial wave function and an exact wave function. This is what we calculate in Projector Monte Carlo, the mixed estimator. It's neither the variational or the exact. But what you can show is, of course, that it's halfway in between. And this is important information, but it, unfortunately, it's not the information that you want, particularly. And uh, basically, suppose you're calculating something like, I don't know, the pressure, the potential energy. Um, you calculate a value from variational Monte Carlo and a value from uh, diffusion Monte Carlo. You get two different values. You can use this formula to roughly correct the mixed estimator to get the exact estimator because you can basically expand in terms of the difference between the trial wave function and the exact wave function and show that this is true in the limit that the trial wave function is very good. So in other words, if you get the potential energy in variational Monte Carlo is two, and in the um, projector Monte Carlo is one, you can sort of estimate it's gonna be zero, the exact value. But that's only to, true to second order in the trial function. Um, so that, it, it really is an indication of how you should change your trial function to get better answers. That's what you should use it for. Um, now there are other solutions. So this is a, a linear extrapolation, it's called. And you, there's other linear extrapolations. For example, you can do it uh, using this method too. Uh, this has the, the second formula has the advantage that it keeps, it keeps the quantity positive, whereas this you, for example, if you try to do it for the electronic density, you could end up with negative densities, whereas this quantity, this is actually exact for the uh, non-interacting density, and it'll keep it positive. So that's why you might want to have different formulas. There is an exact relation between these estimators and the so-called overlap. Well, the overlap is this integral, which is uh, the difference between the exact wave function and the trial wave function. If you try to optimize your trial wave function to maximize the overlap, you can show that the mixed estimators will equal the variational estimator, and this correction will be zero. Uh, so that, that's so-called maximum overlap method, which I've used rather successfully in order to optimize wave functions. And you know, it's somewhat it's different than uh, minimizing the energy. Uh, it, it, it tries to uh, maximize the overlap of wave functions. Another method I'll talk about is forward walking, and an even better method is reptation quantum Monte Carlo, which has a much less severe mixed estimator problem. Um, and so these are some of the uh, more complicated methods. This method is just kind of a crude method uh, to take data that you already have coming out of diffusion Monte Carlo to estimate how things would change if you had the exact estimator. Now, forward walking, introduced originally by Kalos in 74, says use the information in the, uh, with the branching random walks to correct estimators. Um, you have all these branching random walks, and let's suppose you calculate a quantity, like the potential energy, at some point along the random walk. If you take the average potential energy with just average overall walkers, the potential energy, in this scheme, you average according to the number of descendants of a walker. Like, you guys, most of you are not old enough to have kids, but suppose you did. 
Okay. I have three kids and one grandkid. So if I were going to go one generation in the future, my potential energy would count three. My, if I go in two generations in the future, I might have more grandkids eventually, but I would get a weight of one. That's what would count for the average potential energy. I would take all of you guys and I would count how many kids you had and I would weight your potential energy according to the, you're not just the average over the people here, but over your children, right? So that's what you do with your walkers. Now, what is the mathematics? This is the mathematics behind it. Um, this is the population resulting from a point R0 at time t. So again, how many descendants of the point R0 at time t later? Well, this is the propagator, and this is the important sampling thing. And now we expand again, like we did on the first slide, in terms of exact eigenfunctions, and we get this limit. We say the population at time t is given by this uh, number constant times the exact wave function of the trial wave function. So, in other words, we can correct the mixed distribution. If we take the mixed distribution and we multiply by this factor, that is, the, the future descendants of a given walker, that corrects the mixed distribution to get the exact distribution. Now, the tricky thing is this limit, t goes to infinity. Right, because it turns out that it, it, the method is unstable at large time. Because, well, you probably all know this, like, if you take all the people in, say, Asia, like, 20% are descended from Genghis Khan, right? Because he was rich and had lots of <laughs> wives and so forth. So it's like that with the walkers, right? If you go 100 generations in the future, all the walkers will descend from one walker, and your statistical ef efficiency will go to zero. Okay, but it can work. It can correct things. And so here's an example I did a number of years ago about uh, fusion calculation. I wanted to calculate, this is a three-body problem, that is a muon, a deuteron, and a triton. I wanted, we were trying to calculate the fusion, the, uh, the fusion sticking coefficient, at this singular place, that is, what is the probability, what is the wave function when the deuteron and the triton fuse, right? And a muon was the thing that bound them together. So here was the population versus the number of iterations. And you see, if you did variational Monte Carlo, you would end up, well, I'll just have to tell you, a number 1.6. That's the mix estimator for the, the wave function. It's trying to calculate. We're actually calculating a wave function with quantum Monte Carlo, not an energy. So I get in 1.6. But you see the actual answer is 2.4. So I saw how the populations evolve in time, and I saw that actually, you know, the correct answer is 2.4. And you see you get a nice plateau region, but what happens is that the error bars grow in time, right? That's what I was saying. It's unstable at large time, but because this is a three-body problem, you know, you can kill it, right? There is a, a, a physical time where it takes to converge. You can see this. The question is how, how good your trial function is and how much branching you have before, before uh, the noise kills you, basically. Anyway, that's an idea of a, of a, uh, a forward-walking application. Now, we get to the big issue, and that's fermions. Uh, you see, of course, the problem is in the very first step, uh, we have this initial weight function, and when you have more than two electrons, you say, wait a minute, you can't interpret that as a probability. Half of the phase space is positive and half is negative. Uh, so what do you do? The obvious thing is you just take, you carry along the sign of the wave function as a weight. And this is called either transient estimate or release node or an exact fermion method. And I'll show you what's wrong with it. Uh, basically, here is the, uh, a little bit of mathematics to explain that a little bit. Um, suppose we take your tr initial wave function and we use this as a projector, right? 
And now we want to calculate beta. I, I changed from T to beta, but it's the same thing. Um, we want to calculate, say, this, um, uh, this overlap, this normalization of the wave function of beta. Uh, you know, we want to calculate the square of the, the projected wave function, okay? And we expand out in terms of a path, right? Using Trotter's formula, right? And this is how we um, uh, compute the energy, this ratio, in terms of the local energy. Now, but and we want to do this integral right here. And so the, all of these factors here are positive. So they can be interpreted as probability. Well, we have to take the absolute value of the trial wave function. And that's what we call sigma, the absolute value of the trial function. Or it's actually, I'm sorry, this is the absolute value. Now we have a probability here of our random walk. And sigma is the, uh, the sign or the phase if we have a complex wave function. OK, but it, it, essentially it's either plus or minus. So it, 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 in the case we have a real wave function, sigma would be plus if psi is uh, positive or minus 1 if psi is negative, right? And so we get the, this normalization is given by the expectation over all these random walks, this integral here, of the product of the sign at the beginning of the random walk and the end of the random walk. So now I have a picture here explaining that. Um, so we have, suppose we have one particle in a box. It's always hard to show an example of fermions because, you know, the, the simplest real example is, involves three particles, right? And so it's hard to show that uh, graphically. So we have one particle and we want to make, we have a, a symmetry point here in the middle of the box where the V is symmetrical, and we want to get the anti-symmetric state, right? And so we have, Suppose this is a trial wave function, and the pink region is, say, positive, and the blue region is, is uh, negative. And so, the, uh, as I showed before, the energy would be given by the product of the sine of the walker when it started out times the sine of the walker times t later times the energy, the local energy, divided by this normalization factor, right? And th this is just the trial node. But the true wave function could have a node like this. Could be a different place, um, and, as I'll explain in a few minutes. And the, the, if we knew where this node is, we could use this fixed node method that I'll talk about. Um, but because we don't, the walkers, you can ev imagine them like uh, two armies, like the uh, I don't know, like in the United States, the North and the South fighting each other. And this is the line that separates them. And, you know, if you get a stronger uh, flux of uh, negative walkers here, it would push the node between uh, the positive and negative, you know, to one side. It always has to remain symmetrical like it is here, but it doesn't have to be on this line. And the trouble is, if, okay, so if we look on this line here, across, you know, uh, along this one-dimensional section of the, of the phase space, then it starts out with, you know, the positive walkers and the negative walkers. They're separated. But if we allow them to cross this boundary here, um, then these two distributions overlap, right? And you just end up with noise. Basically, your signal-to-noise ratio goes to zero. Um, and, it, and, and you can show that the computer time needed, and basically, the, what's the reason? Um, it's because these two signs become uncorrelated with each other. That is, you have the, if it, it's short time, um, that is small t, that the, the walkers haven't gotten very far from here, and these two signs are about the same, so you get, uh, Either they're both plus or they're both minus, but the product is positive, right? But at large time, they become uncorrelated, and whether this sum is positive or negative 
is just random. You get zero over zero, essentially, plus or minus some noise, right? And so that leads uh, to uh, an exponential complexity in the computer time it needs to, um, to achieve a certain error. In fact, the computer time needed to get an error epsilon scales with the number of fermions and how uh, the difference between the uh, Fermi and Bose energy, basically, or how much the Fermi energy is above the boson energy. And it's not that this, this method is an exact method, um, and I'll show you an example of a calculation. Here's a, a calculation we did in 1994 with 26 fermions in two dimensions, and we were calculating uh, an excitation energy of the electron gas, and these are two different wave functions. And so you see, you know, it, uh, and that's one of the things you can, you should do in diffusion Monte Carlo is see if your results are independent of the trial wave function. So basically, this would be the variational Monte Carlo result here at zero time. This is projection time. And so this is one, this is the trial function slater Jastro, and this is with backflow right here. And you can see that they come down and they're consistent with each other, and there's a plateau region here. And this is presumably the exact answer, right? The trouble is, with the sign problem, is you just cannot push this too far. I don't know if you can see, but the air bars are starting to grow right here, right? So it comes down, you see it's converging, and then the air bars kill you, right? You get a sequence of upper bounds as you're coming down, but you're not really sure. You cannot, okay, we could go up to 15, time units, but we couldn't go up to 30 time units because essentially this ratio here, I would get zero over zero, and the error bars would be uh, very large, right? And of course, you know, you could run longer, and I think this method actually is going to become, come back in fashion. I mean, the fact that we can do a million times more calculations than we could a few years ago means that you know, we can extend this out to a factor of two, but you can't extend it out to a factor of 10, right? You can push it. And again, it's something that by making better trial functions, you can see the improvement with making a better trial function. You got much more confidence in the result because you get to this plateau quicker. But again, this is uh, 26 electrons, so it's not really, I think in, in the community, there's a feeling this is only good for really small systems, but that's not really the issue. It's how fermionic the problem is. Here is a general statement of the fermion problem. Uh, that it, basically, the sign problem is to find a method that will, all approximations have to be under control in practical sense and they have to be demonstrated that you can actually control all the approximations in it. And the question is, how much computer time does it take to make an estimate of a property to an accuracy epsilon, and how does the computer time scale with the number of fermions and epsilon? In a solved problem, the computer time um, would only grow with some low power of the number of fermions and it would decrease in Monte Carlo as one of the accuracy squared. Again, this is, if you want one more decimal place, you have to run 100 times longer. That's what this says. The Fermion problem, you have this kind of scaling, that is the computer time grows exponentially and, um, I'm sorry, there shouldn't be a minus sign there. It should be positive exponential. Now, there are solved Fermion problems if you want to solve the fermion problem, you do not think about one-dimensional problems because those are solvable. Because in one dimension, you can say that anti-symmetry is equivalent to exchange on a line, an ordering. One-dimensional problems are really quite different than two and three. Because in two dimensions, you can exchange without touching each other by going around each other. When it's in one dimension, you can just simply forbid exchanges, and you know that fermions map into bosons. Bosons and Boltzmannons at any temperature are solvable in thermodynamics um, in situation, not in dynamics. There are many lattice models that are solvable, 
uh, for example, the Heisenberg model, the half-filled Hubbard model. Um, the harmonic uh, systems that have a lot of symmetries, like harmonic oscillators, are solvable. A lot of people have thought about this, so if you come up with a solution, of course everyone's going to say, you, you don't understand the problem. So you better understand the problem if you come up with a solution. You see, you see publications yearly about people claiming to have solved the problem, but it's usually because they, um, they don't understand, okay, nobody in science tells you what the problem is. The problem is to find a method that has no uncontrolled approximations and scales to large n, right, in a polynomial fashion. It's not simply a matter of taking existing algorithms and numerically showing you get pretty good results. You, have to, you, have to, you actually have to prove that it uh, converges and you don't have uncontrolled approximation. There are very many good physics methods that are very accurate, but n they're not exact solutions. Um, of course, some people think that you need to have quantum computers to solve quantum problems. I guess I'm open-minded about that, whether we'll ever have quantum computers, but, uh, you know, it's possible. Uh, it's possible. It's not known. I mean, there is a theorem from Troyer and Wiese that says the sign problem is NP-complete. That means it's very difficult computationally. But this is only, they've only shown that there exists a quantum mini product problem that is very difficult. It's actually a quantum glass problem, right? It does not prove that calculating the properties of plutonium or something is, has a sign problem. Okay, so we don't know which problems are hard and which problems are not hard. We know that there's a list of problems that are solvable without a sign problem, but we don't know which, one, which problems that you may be interested in uh, have a a fundamental sign problem or not. We just know that there exist quantum problems that will never be solved in polynomial complexity. Now, so how do we solve them? So actually, I'm kind of going quite slowly, but the, what have we been doing the last 35 years? Well, we've been using the fixed node method, and that's saying we take, we set our unknown wave function to zero when the trial wave function equals zero. And that means that we don't, we don't have to worry about the sign of the wave function anymore. And you can show that this gives you an upper bound to the ground state energy. It gives you the best upper bound um, possible with this condition. And so uh, Hartree-Fock wave function would have an energy like on the third floor. And you might say variational Monte Carlo comes down and gets 95% of the correlation energy. We think fixed node would give you another um, factor of four, so closer to the energy. And so even though you don't get the exact energy, without doing any more intellectual work, you can get another factor of four in the correlation energy. So you can go from, say, 90% to 98%. With just the same trial function, with instead of doing variational Monte Carlo, you do this branching random walk, right? which takes longer, but that's computer time, not human time at that stage. Um, so it scales well, like the variational Monte Carlo method is in cubed. Um, it's an accurate method because all the correlations in the modulus is completely free. Now, now what is the approximation? The approximation is we're fixing the nodes of the trial wave function, and basically, um, what are the nodes? Well, again, um, we're working with real wave functions, so problems that don't have magnetic fields. I'll get to the complex ones in a minute. The nodes are a place where the wave function vanishes. Um, sorry, this is supposed to be phi, not f. Another font problem. Um, the nodes are a three n to minus one dimensional surface, so you don't want to confuse them with the nodes of the single particle orbital, although sometimes they may be uh, uh, um, uh, related, um, there are places where you know what the nodes are, and those are so-called coincident points when two electrons are at the same place. But you see, this is three equations, so these are a manifold of three and minus three dimensions. So they're like a framework 
uh, uh, that hold the node. So this is like this point. We know this point has to be on the nodal surface, but that doesn't mean we know where the nodal surface is. We just know one point. And so these coincident points do not describe the whole nodal surface, except in one dimension. In one dimension, this is everything. That's why you can solve one-dimensional problems. You might think, oh, this is going to be a problem because our random walks are going to get stuck in nodal volumes. Well, we proved something called the tiling theorem that says you don't have to worry about this usually. That is, there are essentially only two, that all the nodal volumes are equivalent to each other. It's like this random walk back here, this picture. There, it doesn't matter if you stat the random walk over here, over here, because they're the same, right? They're two ha they're, there is a symmetry operator, and so you can prove that. And not in general, but um, in, in the case that you take the trial wave function from a physical problem. You can make trial wave functions where you have all sorts of crazy nodes, but in general, it's okay. I wanted to mention, this is important, for what comes up, the fixed phase method. What happens if you have a complex wave function? Um, you can generalize the fixed node method, as we did in this paper, to call it fixed phase. And uh, basically, it's a generalization. Basically, you take a trial wave function, and you take the logarithm of it, and this is complex. So u now is a complex function, has real and imaginary parts. And we can write down the variational energy of this function in terms of the real parts and the imaginary parts. And, um, and because the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian, uh, you can get rid of some of the terms. Um, and basically, for example, this term, this is psi squared, and it's the modulus of psi squared, so you only have the real part of u here. And here's the potential energy. Here's, um, this part has real and imaginary terms in it. And um, here you have a, a real term, and here you have an imaginary term. And some of the, the cross terms drop out. Um, but the point is, suppose you were now do a, a variation of the variational energy with respect to the, just the real part of you, keeping the imaginary part of you fixed. You could just regard this as a fixed potential. Right? And these parts you now solve with the diffusion Monte Carlo equation, uh, the diffusion Monte Carlo um, method, and that's the fixed phase method. So basically, all you have to do if you have a complex wave function is add in an additional term to the potential energy, which comes from the phase of the method. That's why it's called fixed phase. So this is the imaginary part of u, the gradient squared. And this comes up all over in physics, like quantum Hall effect and so forth. If you actually have a vector potential, you have to add that in too, like if you have a magnetic field. So basically, what the diffusion Monte Carlo does is says, OK, let's fix the phase. Let's take a trial wave function. Let's fix the phase. Phase comes from a mean field method. And let's use this diffusion Monte Carlo machinery to find the best possible modulus with that particular phase. It gives you the lowest energy, so you get an upper bound to the energy. The low, it's better than the, than the variational Monte Carlo energy, but it's going to be above the exact energy. And if your phase is actually correct, you'll have the exact answer. Um, now, it turns out you know, these are good approximations. That is, um, the, uh, because the phase, again, is limited by you know, you have certain rules like taking particles around the boundaries or interchanging two fermions that the phase has to do certain things. It has to have a, a bosonic-like symmetry. And um, uh, so this is actually what we do when we do twisted boundary conditions is we actually do fixed node. And it reduces to fixed node if this wave function turns into a real wave function because this ends up as a delta function that divides the positive regions and the negative regions and prevents walkers from going from one region to another. Um, so again, the fixed node method is what you do. I think this is actually what I missed saying, is how do you actually do this 
in Diffusion Monte Carlo. How do you implement this? It's very, very simple. <laughs> Actually, there's two methods. And there's a, there's a debate in the community about what to do. You have a trial wave function that's anti-symmetric, like a Slater determinant. And it's the best wave function you can come up with. So during the random walk, you compute the trial wave function. And if you see the sign of the trial wave function changes from positive to, the positive to negative or negative to positive, you have crossed the node, right? And if you were not doing important sampling, you would just simply kill that walker. And I think I showed you way back in that flow diagram where I had that. You would kill the walker. Okay. Now, the situation gets more complicated when you have important sampling. Why? It's because the gradient that you do an important sampling with pushes your walkers away from the node because there's a quantum force which is proportional to the gradient of the log of psi t, and it pushes your walkers away from the node. Um, and you could still cross the node through a time step error, but mathematically you're still supposed to be crossing the node. It's kind of a, it seems almost paradoxical when you imply important sampling. I won't get into this. If you, if you think about it too much, you might get confused. If you don't think about it too much, it's okay. But the, <laughs> the trouble is that as you approach the node, the, the drift is pushing you away from the node. It turns out that there's a delta function sitting right at the nodal location, and that will cause infinite branching. And that's the way walkers can tunnel through the node mathematically. But in an approximate algorithm, you never see this because you don't have that delta function in there. And so, in fact, it's correct just simply to reject walkers as they're crossing the node. Or you can kill them. Either way works. And you can try and see which one has a smaller time step error. It's both time step errors. And they're both correct procedures, actually. Um, uh, but the, you know, and as a further, you can ask about methods to further reduce the time step error. And there's some people that I think Kuhn Zipak does this that actually makes changes the quantum force as it's approaching the node so it doesn't diverge like one over x. It should it does diverge like one over x and that goes to infinity. And so what you do is you 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 tame that singularity and sh you can show that that's the right thing to do. And that has a smaller time step error. Basically, these are methods to reduce the time step error. Here is the proof that I had of the fixed node theorem that is that you get an upper bound to the ground state energy. What, this is what we want to show. Is there something called the fixed node wave function, which is the solution to the Schrodinger equation, the exact solution to the Schrodinger equation, with these boundary conditions, that it uh, vanishes on the surface of a volume. And you can apply a permutation operator and show that you can come up with a, a, uh, a fermion, an anti-symmetric wave function with these boundary conditions, and then you put it in the variational theorem and show that that gives you uh, essentially an upper bound to the ground state energy, but it has to be lower than the variational Monte Carlo energy because, uh, you know, it, the, uh, well, you can say because you're minimizing the energy with respect to the wave function inside the nodal domain. So here is a, is a it just gives you a picture, I don't know, I made this a number of years ago, uh, of, uh, uh, gives you an idea of how complicated the nodal surfaces are. Again, these are not nodal surfaces in three dimensions. These are nodal surfaces in three n dimensions. So what I took was um, 161 electrons in a, a periodic box. And the electrons are those open circles, right? And the, I let the last electron be this black dot, and it moves around and the other 160 electrons were fixed at the sampled positions that are shown. And so then I drew a line whenever the wave function vanished, right? And so these are the nodal surfaces. This is a slice through this huge dimensional space. It's like taking your brain and slicing it. And you see the brain has a nice structure, but when you cut it like that, you lose all the symmetries, okay? 
And so basically the nodal surface, it, it has to be a curve that goes through all the dots. It's like the, the, the thing that kids do of connecting the dots and making a picture, right? It has to go through all the dots and this, uh, because the wave function has to vanish whenever this electron hits another electron. The, these are only spin up electrons, by the way. Uh, there's no spin down electrons. You see there's, this, there's nodes that are densely packed. That's because uh, there has to be a nodal surface within. Um, you can show that that has to be true because this is a free Fermi gas and has a Fermi surface. And there has to be nodes every uh, in, uh, on the order of one interparticle spacing. Now, you might think, wow, there's a lot of little nodal pockets and things. But these are not pockets in the high dimensional space. These are only pockets because we sliced this huge phase space into two dimensions. But you can show by doing three particle exchange, that is three electrons, that you can move everywhere in the, the, no, in the positive region without crossing a node. In fact, you can show there's only two nodal regions in, in this high dimensional phase space. Yeah? Uh, in the previous case, we knew that Pelder is uh, a positive. Dimension. Yeah. Would it be possible to color this? Yeah. Positive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't color, but like, suppose we started out this is positive, then just like you would color, a kid would color, this would be negative, and that would be negative, and so forth. Yeah. So all the connected regions. Yeah, yeah. But there, uh, what I was saying is that they're actually. It's possible to go from all the positive regions to all the other positive region. We can show this mathematically without crossing nodes in two or three dimensions. It's not true in one dimension, but in higher dimensions, it's true. Actually, Lubo Smita showed this. I actually proved it computationally, but he proved it mathematically. Okay, the fixed phase method is kind of important. Somebody asked me at the break about phase. Why do you want? to use real wave functions and uh, complex wave functions and so forth. Most of previous diffusion Monte Carlo and variational Monte Carlo was done with real wave functions. But there's no real reason that you can't use complex wave functions. It turns out complex wave functions are a little bit slower to compute, but they have some nice features. And sometimes it's absolutely necessary to do complex wave functions. Um, and basically, um, uh, everything that's, it, it, maybe it's easy to think about real wave functions, uh, but you know, it's maybe better to think about complex wave functions. With complex wave functions, you have to add this term to the branching, which is the gradient of the phase of your trial wave function. You have to compute this and add it to it. And as the wave function becomes real, this becomes a delta function, and this essentially kills walkers that cross the nodes. And this is how the fixed node method arises out of the fixed phase method. So the, the fixed phase is the generalization of the fixed node. You are not, this is one thing I didn't say, is why aren't we solving the Schrodinger equation? We're not solving the Schrodinger equation because we're not solving the imaginary part of the Schrodinger equation. We have an error. By using this fixed phase method, we're solving, you can divide the Schrodinger equation into a real part and imaginary part, and by doing fixed phase, we're solving exactly the real part of the Schrodinger equation, but we have an error in the imaginary part, and that's called the continuity equation. And um, if you have the exactly correct phase, you will be solving uh, the, the continuity equation. But we've used this not only, there's several places we use fixed phase. You'll learn about twisted boundary conditions later on to reduce finite size effects. And that requires you to use complex wave functions. And um, so that's a way of reducing finite size effects. It's like doing a Brillouin zone integration in solid state physics. But also, for example, if you want to do a vortex or if you want to do a phonon or these kinds of things, you need to have complex wave function. If like this example I said about the p-state of the hydrogen atom, if you want to do the p-state, you can use a complex wave function, right? Uh, instead of a real wave function. 
But if you're only interested in ground state of molecules, usually you can get away with a real wave function. And I wanted to mention, because I think Miguel said he wasn't going to talk about this, is a little bit about wave functions beyond the Jastrow wave function. Um, I mentioned last time about the Feynman-Katz formula, which gives you a method of taking the local energy and making an improved wave function. And this is the formula that I discussed. Uh, you take a trial function, uh, uh, phi n, and then you take the local energy of the trial function uh, and put it up in the exponent with a parameter tau, and you smooth it out, and that becomes a better trial function. You don't do this, well, you could do this computationally, but generally speaking, you do it analytically. And I told you before that the zeroth order, if you take a, um, just a Hartree type of wave function like this, then the local energy is the potential energy and you end up with a Jastrow. So that would be going from phi zero to phi one. How about from phi one to phi two? Well, you take a Jastrow wave function, Slater Jastrow wave function, and you put it in this formula and you come up with this wave function. This is the local energy. And you have two new terms appear. You have, first of all, we call this the three-body term, and we call this the backflow term. And basically, what the three-body term does is says, well, I won't describe this. This is a bosonic term, and this, uh, well, you would get it for, uh, for bosons. This term you get for fermions in addition. This says, let's not work, when we take the Slater determinant, Let's not work with, um, you know, rows would be the orbitals and columns would be the electrons. Let's, instead of working with electron coordinates, work with dressed electron coordinates. So the new coordinate is r minus the gradient of y, where y is a new pair function, is the backflow function, and which you use to generate a force that pushes the electrons around. So now, Every matrix element, instead of becoming a single body matrix element, becomes a mini body matrix element. And this is what perturbation theory says that correlated wave functions should have in them, right? This is a kind of a perturbation argument, okay? And so here again is, this is for the electron gas where the orbitals are just simply plane waves. And Instead of working with e to the i k dot r for a determinant, we work with e to the i k dot x, where x is r plus a force depending on coming from the other electrons. And here is what this force function is. It's not singular like 1 over r because we do this smoothing operation. Over here, we have a smoothing. And so we consider this eta function as a variational function, and we parameterize it, and we try to find the best eta function. This is variational Monte Carlo. This is the electron density here. This is divided by the error of Slater Jastrow, and this is the error in the, the, uh, with this new backflow wave function. And I should have marked what all these symbols are, but you can see that the most accurate thing that has both uh, three body and backflow gets 90% of the energy that's missing in Slater Jastrow. Remember, Slater Jastrow already got 95% of the energy. This is getting another, getting up to 99% of the energy by including this. Now, I should warn you that electron gas is a very simple system, just electrons, no ions, and you don't get this kind of improvement out of some arbitrary molecule, right? This is a special case because in electron gas, there are not very many things that you can add to the wave function that have all the right symmetries. And backflow is a, and three body are about the only ones. But the important thing with diffusion Monte Carlo is that this changes the nodal surfaces. If we just stick with this, we have free particle nodal surfaces. This tells you that one of the ways that nodes can change is through backflow. Right? through the matrix elements in the Slater determinant becoming coupled together, so they become mini-body matrix elements, right? Uh, and it couples together. This 
if you talk about spin, you have a determinant of spin up and spin down, and the nodes are a product of spin up nodes and spin down nodes. Once you put in backflow, the nodes become coupled, to, the spin up and spin down become coupled together. Now, there's a disadvantage with backflow from a computational point of view is that you cannot use your matrix update tricks with backflow anymore because everything's coupled together. Okay, so you pay a price of n, that is the number of electrons. Well, luckily, computers have gotten faster more than a factor of n. So, okay, there's a price to be paid. But anyway, you can do it. Okay, so here is a, the proof of the pudding. I showed you this yesterday. This is the energy and the variance. And so here, here is the slider gesture wave function. And here is the, the best variational wave function. You see you've got a lot of the energy and a lot of the variance. And then you run fixed node on that, and you can get down to here, which is, we think, pretty close to the exact answer. Uh, you guys, uh, some of you may have heard of Alavi's work on um, uh, QMC with uh, full CI QMC. And they actually get about almost the same energy as we do with a f almost like an exact diagonalization of the electron gas problem. Um, so there's a confirmation that of these energies coming from other methods. Here is a kind of a summary, which I showed you yesterday. The blue is variational Monte Carlo with a simple wave function and a backflow wave function. And now we can do fixed node QMC, projector QMC, and we follow these lines. Now why is this line over here that is it's slower? Why is it slower? That the fact that it's higher here means to get the same error bar, you have to run longer. Does anybody have any idea why is diffusion Monte Carlo slower than variational Monte Carlo? He said it's because of the force. No, that's not the answer. There are many walkers. No, that's not the answer. No, that's not the answer. I, I said it earlier. Come on. What did I say about the acceptance ratio or something like that? Yeah, yeah. The problem is your time step has to be smaller because you want to accurately calculate this, this projector. Whereas in variational Monte Carlo, you, don't, you make the time step just on the basis of efficiency. It could be anything. You should get the same answer. But in diffusion Monte Carlo, you have to have that acceptance ratio like 99%. Your time step is slower. So it takes longer to run, but it's a fixed amount. It's like a factor of 10 slower. But if you keep running long enough, you end up with lower energies than in for without any more work, because you program to calculate the wave functions, the gradients, and the local energy. So you have all that program. You have all your wave functions optimized. So just at the spending more time on the computer, you get lower error bars, right? Now, if you want to do transient estimate or release node, you can start out from there and get even better energies with exact fermion methods. But the slope is no longer a half. It becomes less than a half. And this converges exceedingly slowly. But you can gain a little bit of errors, right? The real way to achieve this is to go to switch to a better wave function, to try to optimize your nodes or whatever, to follow this line down here, and then maybe do a little release node down there. OK, so that's the idea. Now, along, I made this slide almost 20 years ago, so now maybe since computer time has increased, maybe we're over here, we can do real applications, right, uh, with these methods. So here's my summary slide. Fixed node is really, if you think about it, is not an exact method. It's a super variational method. It allows you to optimize things in the modulus of the wave function without thinking. Um, you can find the best energy uh, with a given nodal surface or a given phase of the wave function. In principle, we can vary those nodal surfaces by looking at the trial function. Um, the zero variance principle allows very accurate calculations if your trial function is good. Um, but there are, there are still methods that take a trial function and perturb around it to get the exact answer. And you should not think that it's going to go, say you have a, 
a mod insulator, it's going to go over and make a metal, or it's going to go from one phase and flip over to another phase. It's probably not going to do that. Uh, it's very difficult to use these methods to study phase transitions without knowing what the phases are, right? And so it's really a way of saying, well, I think the wave function is approximately this. Let's get the best energy within this uh, type of wave function. There's a difficulty um, calculating properties in projector methods other than the energy uh, because we get this mixed estimator. There are ways using forward walking or extrapolated estimators to improve it, but you know, they have their problems. And so there are other methods like rotation uh, uh, or path integral methods where, that are better for getting other properties or better for studying phase transition. So I will stop there and Miguel, you ready?